so good morning, everybody. Good evening for those who are joining from East Coast and uh, US, United States. Thank you very much for joining our 20th uh, special dialogue hosted by Global Health Innovation Policy Program at GRIPS. My name is Hiromi Murakami of Global Health Innovation Policy Program, and I'm facilitating this dialogue series. We're very honored to welcome very special guests from Boston, United States, Mr. Samuel Leiter, Dr. Eric Hagenbotham, and Dr. Dick Samuels of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We're so excited in hearing their views on Ukraine today, maybe East Asia tomorrow, Japan's lessons from Ukraine war. And today's session is co-sponsored by ICAS TUJ. We'd like to thank them uh, for their support. And in this dialogue series, um, we're addressing a broader issues uh, from health security to regional crisis, in particular focusing on Japan's challenges. A lot of assumptions has changed since COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine. And obviously Ukraine's situation implies very difficult challenges and we have not yet figured out you know, what to do next. So for that reason, we're very excited to have special guests with such a uh, hot topic and that we are grateful for sharing uh, your analysis and concerns with us. With that, I'd like to pass the microphone to Dr. Dick Samuels. We very much appreciate that you're taking time for us. It's all yours, thank you. Thanks very much, Murakami-sensei. It, it's a great pleasure to return to GRIPS even if only virtually this time. I want to thank you and Kurokawa-sensei for your kind invitation uh, to us. Uh, we set off, uh, that is, Sam and Eric and I set off last summer to consider how the war in Ukraine might affect Japan's security policy on the eve of the publication of the three documents that we, like you and your audience, uh, anticipate would update existing Japanese security policies and priorities, or even introduce new ones. And, and certainly it was clear uh, that the national security discourse in Japan heated up considerably after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that said, we have to remember that uh, discussion of national security was already on a low boil. Um, in, just as an example, um, in August uh, 2021, a year ago, more than a year ago, I, I took a very quick look at how the ragged uh, and undisciplined U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan was connecting to the Japanese conversation about a Taiwan contingency. And, and I found a remarkable number of links to stories asking, will Japan be just like Afghanistan? Well, I'm sorry, will Taiwan be just like Afghanistan? Will Japan be just like Afghanistan? In other words, um, people were concerned uh, in large numbers that Japan might also be abandoned uh, by the United States. Now, it was clear that despite, despite very fundamental differences in the U.S. relation to Afghanistan and the treaty alliance um, uh, relationship with Japan, the Taliban's victory began to feed existing concerns about U.S. commitments and U.S. capabilities uh, to defend Japan. So predictably, the crisis in Ukraine further uh, stimulated these concerns, and that low boil that I just described began to bubble very vigorously um, after February of this year. Uh, when I did that same Google search, but substituted the word Ukraine for Afghanistan, Google returned twice the number of hits. Uh, sifting, through, sifting through those hits, it was clear that, that the discourse had, had, had really gotten agitated um, and many Japanese were fretting about whether failed US support for Ukraine, should it fail to support Ukraine, might undermine extended deterrence in Northeast Asia. So like you uh, and the audience, um, my colleagues and I have been eagerly awaiting the first new national security strategy, Japan's first new national security strategy since 2013, as well as the new national defense strategy, uh, the, first, the first one since the NDPG in 2018, and the defense buildup plan, which I believe are being announced as we speak with you this morning, um, your time. Uh, but there all, have already been plenty of leaks, so we have a a fair sense of, of what to expect from them, but we're looking forward to reading them. And as we began to examine the evidence, it became clear to us, as perhaps we should have realized from the beginning of the project, that much of what happens in government reflects prior preferences as much as new circumstances. Uh, and of course, 
there are there's plenty of both that is the prior preferences and plenty of new circumstances for what it's worth um you know i was familiar with this dynamic from the work that i did at grips um on how different uh, stakeholders interpreted the lessons that should be drawn from the triple catastrophe in total into 2011 the the, the project that that murakami sensei kindly referred to so as, as I wrote at that time, despite all those calls for a rebirth, for a rejuvenation, for a renaissance in Japan, all, despite all that, very few policy preferences changed as a result of the disaster. Each stakeholder had an opinion. It, it cherry picked the data and worked very hard to use 311 to shape national policy in an effort to tilt the balance of history in the direction of their choosing. And so, we wondered if we might see a similar process after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That is to say, we assumed that it, that is the, the invasion, uh, and other external events uh, likely would support or accelerate trends that are, and thinking that was already underway, and that the Ukraine case would be used selectively to advance existing preferences. We went in thinking that. Now, that's not to say we didn't expect, we, don't, we had no expectation there would not be change. It's a double negative, I apologize. We, we do expect change, but simply that the Russian invasion of Ukraine, like the rise of China, uh, the militarization of China, the pro provocations from China may have widened an already opening door for longtime advocates of major security policy change that they could stride through the open door. Uh, we also suspect that, that even large and dramatic changes in Japan's national security posture, the sorts that engender screaming headlines, the ones we'll see tomorrow, um, um, may not necessarily be optimal responses to shifts in the strategic environment in Northeast Asia, uh, or even appropriate responses to or characterizations of what happened in Ukraine. So we have, we have come to believe that the changes that we and you together will, will observe uh, will have been shaped by prior preferences of Japan's strategists and stakeholders. So that said, what we're doing today is reporting on a work in progress, and, and we want to stipulate up front that we have, we have open minds regarding what we have heard and what we have seen, and that we await the three reports uh, very eagerly. Uh, we know there will be changes, and that some will be quite striking. Indeed, the headlines in the Chinese and the Korean press are already sounding quite alarmist to our ears. Now, at this point, we can observe that before national policies are determined in response to changes in the security environment, that environment uh, is viewed and processed through different lenses. It's subjected, they're subjected to the crucible of different kinds of political contexts, a uh, contests, even within the same country within Japan. So as we see it, we, and as we organize our, our analysis, uh, we can talk about the broad strategic level policies where political leadership looms largest, as well as about operational decisions where bureaucratic and service-based interests come into play. So in Japan, of course, I think your audience knows well, conservatives in the ruling LDP are seeking to, who are seeking to build a more normal Japan, normal nation, with fuller spectrum military capabilities, have fully consolidated power and are squared off against a weakened anti-militarist legacy. Uh, and the government is pushing in the same direction as the defense community, uh, a political in engagement that's not always been the case historically, and one that does not serve as a check on the ambitions of either the political leadership or of the defense community. Still, we think that separating our analyses of strategic and operational policy decisions makes analytical sense. So let me just sort of lay that out, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sam and to, to Eric. At that first level, uh, we ask how the political landscape affects how leaders view large strategic issues, the way they establish, in other words, how they establish long-term goals for national security policy. Uh, you know, how have shifts in the strategic environment, for example, China's rise and the relative decline of the United States, how have those things affected strategic choices by Japanese leaders? Will the political class now think differently about how to balance defense against other national priorities, other national policy imperatives? What sorts of external relationships or alliances do they think will be useful beyond the, the existing treaty obligations with the United States? And how will they choose to prioritize them? And in the broadest strategic terms, how might political leaders seek to balance nuclear and conventional capabilities to enhance deterrence? 
Now we want to consider these issues and choices in Japan, just as we would in any other country. Uh, as we would anywhere else, uh, we feel it's useful to explore the nature of domestic politics, its institutional configurations, and the specific interests or alignments of the major political actors, both in the policy class and the political class, but also in the policy community and bureaucracy. Now, we know all too well that this tells us only one part of the story, that is, the look at the political class. At the operational level, that second set of actors and it adds an additional layer of politics and it comes into play. So here's where bureaucrats are most active in shaping defense policy, which we think is an important subset of, of national security policy overall. It seems to us that the policy process is made more complex uh, when the bureaucratic politics and the bureaucratic interests intersect with the political class in any democratic system. It is, after all, at the operational level where ministries of defense and the uniform services help frame relevant issues for politicians. Or put differently, it's here where expertise is concentrated and where defense experts have natural advantages in the policy deliberations. Now, it's of no little significance that in Japan today, the defense community is pulling on the same rope and in the same direction uh, as the political class. And this too keeps the door open for national uh, security policy reform. So just as we would in studying these issues in the US and elsewhere, we wonder how the institutional interests of the MOD and those of the uniform military might fil filter in ways in which the in external environment shapes defense policy choices. That is, we wonder if there are organizational biases, which will, all things being equal, sway the way policy is framed. Will the military or the uniform services prefer offensive or defensive options? How will they balance the two? Do they have preferences for active or passive defenses? What about the balances across services? In this regard, we hear a great deal, maybe from those leaks I mentioned before, uh, about the introduction of jointness, a joint command. Well, will jointness really be embraced after all these years? And what about the prospects for combined forces with the United States? And we wonder under what circumstances and how uh, political leaders might assert their preferences uh, when they are at odds with those of the military and the defense bureaucracy. So these have been some of our concerns. And while we confess we're still sorting out our, our answers in a preliminary way, we're happy to have the chance to take them up with you this morning. So let me start by handing the podium to Sam Leiter, um, as introduced by Murakami Sensei. He's a third year PhD student in the MIT Political Science Department in our Security Studies program. He'll address the strategic issues at the strategic level, and then he'll hand it off, hand off the podium uh, to Eric Hegenbotham, uh, who Murakami Sensei also inter uh, introduced, the principal research scientist at the Center for International Studies at MIT and the Security Studies program. And Eric will, will address the operational issues. And we promise to leave time for Q&A. Thank you all very much. Sam? Uh, thank you, Professor Samuels, for the opening remarks. Thank you to Murakami Sensei, Kurokawa Sensei, and Grips for having us. Um, and thank you all for your attention today. Um, as Professor Samuels mentioned, I'm going to be discussing our observations on Japan's responses to Ukraine at the strategic level. A number of issues were raised in the immediate aftermath of the invasion, and many of these have since been dropped. These include calls by senior politicians for UN reform, for constitutional revision, and for changes in weapons and defense technology transfer policies. We're going to focus on five responses here today that seem to have had a bit more staying power. The first of these is a strengthening of the U.S. alliance amidst growing fear of abandonment. And as Professor Samuels mentioned in the opening remarks, this is tied to the lack of direct U.S. intervention in Ukraine. The second is hedging the alliance through internal and external balancing measures. The third is preparing for a Taiwan contingency. The fourth, updating economic security to address energy security. And the fifth is new support for nuclear sharing and the end of the taboo on the public discussion of nuclear deterrent measures. I'll turn to each of these five issues and discuss them briefly, and we'll be happy to provide more detail on them in Q&A, as well as receive feedback on your thoughts about whether these are the right five issues and whether or not we've identified the key elements of them. So first is a push to strengthen the U.S. alliance. As many of you may know, this is not a new phenomenon. Efforts to increase the role of, the US, uh, of Japan in the U.S. alliance can be traced back to Japan's non-commitment of forces in the first Gulf War, but there was also support for a greater role amongst conservative politicians during the Cold War. However, historically, there's also been a good deal of opposition due to the perceived risks of entrapment, both from political elites and the public. 
In other words, there was a fear that the U.S. could pull the Japan into unwanted conflicts. Today, that seems to be less the case. The Constitutional Democratic Party and its predecessor, the Democratic Party, uh, Party of Japan, were circumspect on the value of the U.S. alliance. But today, the CDP is totally supportive. 2020 polling before the Ukraine war showed that the public preferred being more cautious about the U.S. alliance due to strength, as opposed to strength in it, as opposed to strengthening the role of Japan in it because it feared the risk of entrapment by a margin of about 14%. Today, this has shifted quite dramatically. In April 2022, Asai Shimbun poll showed the public favored invoking collective self-defense to aid the U.S. in a conflict by a margin of 19%. The shift from merely being opposed to strengthening the alliance to being willing to come to the U.S.'s aid in a conflict, I think is quite remarkable, um, and as do my colleagues. Now let's turn to hedging. Hedging is taking both the forms of internal balancing, new defense spending, and external balancing in the form of new relations with allies and partners. In terms of internal balancing, the LDP has said it aims to match the 2% GDP NATO target for its defense spending. This has been directly linked to the invasion of Ukraine repeatedly, including by Foreign Minister Ayashi. However, this goal has been raised and re-raised by conservative politicians since the adoption of the 1% cap, most prominently by former Prime Minister Nakasone. Now, the efficacy of what this new 2% defense spending will be it remains to be seen. As uh, Professor Samuels likes to say, there's a good amount of press digitation smoke and mirrors in the form of raising defense spending by categorizing existing spending, such as the Coast Guard, as defense. When it comes to external balancing, we know that there's been an expansion in the breadth and depths of non-U.S. partnerships to help hedge against the U.S. alliance. This is a continuation of the free and open Indo-Pacific policy that was initiated by Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abe in many ways. And this includes new two plus two ministerial meetings with partners such as Australia, United Kingdom, the Philippines, Germany, in India, Indonesia, and France, and also a stronger trilateral partnership with the Republic of Korea. In particular, there's been quite deeper, there's been much deeper ties with both the United Kingdom and Australia of late. This includes the new sixth generation fighter program that was recently announced, which will be a joint program with both the United Kingdom and Italy, a new intel sharing agreement with Australia, which may have deeper implications after the AUKUS deal, and new reciprocal access agreements with both the United Kingdom and Australia, which set a legal framework for stationing troops in each other's respective countries. I think this offers, and our colleagues, my, I and my colleagues think this offers a particular strategic benefit to Japan since it may complicate any attack on Japan through the co-location of additional forces and offers Japan some resiliency through the ability to use uh, United Kingdom and Australian basing during a crisis. One thing that's important to note is that Japan's hedge has changed over time from the pursuit of warm relations with China to a balancing against it with a wider array of partners. This makes it for a remarkable shift. And these internal and external balancing efforts can both reduce U.S. burden sharing, which is one benefit, but also make it less likely that the U.S. abandons and gives Japan a, and, but also gives Japan more of a safety net in the event that the U.S. does abandon the alliance. Now let's turn to Taiwan. To some degree, it appears that Japan is now pushing, along with the United States, towards strategic clarity. In April of 2022, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe implored the United States to end strategic ambiguity, saying there can no longer be any room for doubt in our resolve concerning Taiwan. Official documents also now routinely link Japan's security to Taiwan. It appeared a record 315 times in the 2022 Defense of Japan White Paper published by the Ministry of Defense, 130 more times than in the prior year's White Paper. And it was quite clear in the importance of Taiwan to Japan's security, stating the stability of the situation around Taiwan is critical for Japan's security, end quote. The, quote, the question, however, remains whether this preparation for joint defense of Taiwan uh, or this linking of Japan's defense of Taiwan is in Japan's interest. While we understand that planning for a Taiwan contingency is prudent, directly linking Japan's defense of Taiwan may increase the risk of a conflict and reduces the likelihood that the U.S.-Japan alliance can diplomatically avoid a confrontation over Taiwan in the future. On economic security, the 2021 economic security law and the new economic security minister position were quite prominent leading up to the invasion of Ukraine. And this was already a focus, but the invasion of Ukraine has brought energy security to have a, more, a larger role within economic security as a result of the exploitation of European reliance on Russian natural gas. In a May 2022 speech, the first minister of economic security uh, highlighted energy security as a key mandate of the economic security law. And since then, Japan has restarted seven nuclear reactors 
and Prime Minister Kishida has proposed extending existing reactor lifespans. I'll now turn to nuclear sharing. Here, we note that uh, uh, politicians have taken note of Russia's nuclear threats, and this has brought the issue of U.S. extended deterrence into the fore. As a non-nuclear country, there's been a note that Russia's nuclear threats have prevented U.S. intervention, both from former uh, Foreign Minister Ayashi and Prime Minister Abe. And this makes it seem as though Japan is quite vulnerable to other, this form of nuclear coercion as well, while simultaneously China is engaging in a nuclear buildup. This nuclear sharing debate was held publicly and public polling supported the discussion of the issue, according to a March 20th SI TV poll. Now, the idea of nuclear sharing has not been pursued and opened by the government and it initially balked at the idea, but remained open to the discussion of it. This aligns with general public support, which does not want to abandon the non-nuclear principles, but is open to the discussion of the topic. So while policy is yet to change, it appears that we will continue to hear more about this topic going forward, as it is no longer taboo to discuss nuclear sharing out in public. So to summarize, the invasion of Ukraine has provided powerful new support for extant preferences in five strategic domains, strengthening the US alliance, hedging against the alliance breakdown, uh, planning for a Taiwan contingency, energy security within economic security, and nuclear sharing. I want to thank you all for your attention. I'm going to turn things over now to Dr. Eric Higginbotham to discuss our notes about the responses at the operational level, and I look forward to everyone's questions. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, and as Sam Mintz said, I'm going to talk about Japan's military responses. Uh, we'd all like to think that a country's military uh, policy, changes in military policy are driven primarily by the external environment and the needs for defense. Uh, as Dick said at the outset, though, um, military reactions to external events are affected by different actors, and those actors bring their own lenses uh, uh, to that assessment. So the first set of actors or lens already discussed by Dick involves uh, the level of national politics. So there we're looking at the preferences of dominant political groups and the nature of uh, political competition, if there is any, over uh, defense issues. As Dick said, in Japan, uh, these preferences uh, on the part of the LDP run strongly towards the normalization of defense to include the acquisition of a well-rounded set of capabilities. Um, so the focus is really on offensive capabilities since that is what Japan currently lacks. The second lens though, I'll say a bit more about that, uh, is bureaucratic and it includes the interests and the preferences of bureaucratic uh, political actors, the Ministry of Defense and the Uniformed Services. Uh, many others, theoreticians, historians, have addressed themselves to military organizations and their uh, and their general preferences. So I direct you there to work by uh, Jack Snyder, Barry Posen, and and others. Um, here I would just list a few sort of principles. These are tendencies, not ironclad rules, but they generally accord with sort of the historical evidence of military bureaucracies. Uh, those organizations are interested in, uh, you know, material things, manpower, especially senior officer billets or positions, uh, money for the organization and prestige. Uh, military organizations will almost always prefer um, active duty forces to other options like fortifications and even reserve forces. They often seek offensive strategies since those are particularly demanding and also tend to lift the prestige of military organizations. And finally, military organizations tend to resist major organizational changes since military leaders will, will be invested in sort of the current set of structures and capabilities. So again, tendencies, not rules. Um, those tendencies can be curbed or overcome, especially by, uh, especially if civilian political authorities have, have the knowledge and inclination to do so. In the Japanese case, though, the preferences of the LDP and the military are currently uh, closely aligned, and they both support the acquisition of uh, additional offensive force structure. So with that, I'll walk through sort of five areas of Japanese military policy and discuss how each relates to external problems, but also um, to bureaucratic preferences. 
So those five include long range standoff strike, the acquisition of missiles. The second is resilience, um, the ability to operate, the ability to sustain strike and continue to operate. New domains, especially space and cyber, other conventional forces within each of the services and command and control uh, issues that affect the relationships between the services. So I'll talk about the first two areas, strike and resilience. Um, and those really provide a study in contrasts. They're kind of bookends. Uh, the MOD's 2023 budget proposal outlines a list of seven priority areas for modernization. Um, you know, this budget proposal came out at the same time as the, the larger documents are being generated. So we expect that those documents are going to reflect some of these same priorities. Both strike and, and resilience made that list of seven, um, but one is at the top and the other is at the bottom of that list. So I'll start with strike. Um, it tops the list at priority number one. In other words, the Ministry of Defense, for the Ministry of Defense, acquiring strike capabilities is the most important task. The wish list includes 10 different types of missiles, and at least one, the Tomahawk, has a range of 1,600 kilometers, which means you could fire it um, from the Nansei Shoto and hit uh, the city of Chongqing very deep in China's interior. Okay, what are all these missiles for? Um, the justification for them has changed dramatically over time. Uh, at first, strike the strike um, mission uh, was to be acquired as part of a base attack capability, Teki uh, Kogeki no Ryoku. And it was designed to destroy North Korean nuclear missiles before they could launch. Later, of course, North Korea developed solid-fueled boosters and mobile missiles, so destroying those missiles before launch uh, was no longer viable. Um, but Japanese missiles might still be used to counterattack North Korean launch sites and limit the number of nuclear warheads that North Korea might launch. So the label then became a base counterattack capability, or Teki Kichi Hangeki no Ryoku. Um, that mission is not terribly compelling or convincing, and the mission for Japanese strike then shifted to a third justification. Uh, it shifted from North Korea to China. The label became standoff missile capability, standoff boe no ryoku. The domain shifted from countering nuclear attack to conventional war fighting. So to sum all of that up, the mission has changed twice. The domain has changed once, the enemy has changed once, but the answer is the same, missiles, missiles, and more missiles. We've got 10 different types of missiles. Now, to be fair, uh, missiles are the munitions of modern air and naval warfare, and it's difficult to fight without them. But they come in all shapes and sizes. So the real question is, am I buying the right missiles for the right missions? If the goal is to defeat some sort of Chinese aggression, say a seizure of a Japanese island or the invasion of Taiwan, then the most pressing operational targets would be ships, since any attack would depend on ships for transporting an invasion force and aircraft, which could be destroyed either on the ground or, uh, I'm sorry, on the ground at their bases or in the air. There are, of course, other possible targets. Um, to include command and control, air bases deep inside of China, offensive missiles, you know, missile launchers, Chinese missile launchers or air defenses. But these are very difficult targets and attacking them carries escalation risk. So unlike the US strategy against Iraq during the first Gulf War, there really is no uh, option here for paralyzing China's larger defense system. And that's true of both the United States and Japan, at least not without enormous cost and enormous risk, essentially, you know, going all in to fight, you know, very large scale World War III. Based on that, one could say the primary tasks really should be operational, defeating attack, not comprehensive strategic defeat. For the operational goal, the primary weapons would include things like standoff anti-ship missiles, such as the JSM Joint Strike Missile, with a range that's got something on the order of 400 kilometers, 
and possibly some number of land attack missiles. So for that latter mission, you could think of the JASM, the air launch JASM, which has a, a range of about a thousand kilometers, or Japan's own Type 12, which Japan is going to extend the range on. But missiles with ranges beyond a thousand kilometers are expensive, difficult to move, and probably not all that useful for Japan. I, I really can't see Japan going to Chongqing during a conflict or even really threatening to do that. So again, I'm not arguing against Japan or we're not arguing against Japan acquiring some types of strike. The real point here, though, is that there are a lot of urgent and important military requirements, but missiles have a place on the top of the list. And that's not just because they're useful. Missiles also hit all the right notes with political and bureaucratic imperatives. Acquisition would make Japan a more normal nation with offensive capability. It would enhance the prestige of the military. And when deployed in ground units, missiles support um, force structure, right? Personnel and units. So now I'm gonna turn to the bottom of the list um, for the contrasting case, which is resilience. Again, this is listed as priority number seven among seven. Um, resilience is the ability to absorb attack by an enemy and to continue to operate effectively as a military force. There are various Japanese translations to include kyojinsei, keizokusei, and kotansei. Uh, China has a large inventory of very accurate ballistic and cruise missiles. The warheads on those missiles can be equipped with submunitions or cluster weapons. And those missiles, therefore, represent a lethal, you know, very serious threat, um, especially to aircraft on the ground, you know, in Japan, both U.S. aircraft at U.S. bases and Japanese aircraft at Japanese bases. Uh, parking areas for aircraft are relatively small. The footprint or the area covered by explosives from each of these missiles is relatively large, and China has enough missiles to cover all aircraft parking areas on all of Japan's bases. So that leads to what has been described as the Zenmetsu Setsu, or the idea that all of Japan's air force could be annihilated within 15 minutes. I've wargamed this a lot, and that Setsu, or proposal hypothesis, is correct. All right, there are a variety of means, though, to improve resilience in the face of threat. There's hardening, the construction of concrete shelters for aircraft or uh, other supplies, dispersion across civilian airports as well as military airfields, concealment, the construction of places for aircraft to hide, mobility, the ability to move units of aircraft to new locations, repair capability for air bases, and active defenses. These are, you know, the, the typical um, anti-aircraft and anti-missile systems. And these measures taken together can create and compound problems for an attacker and lead to much higher rates of missile use by, by that attacker. During the 1980s, the U.S. built about 1,000 hardened aircraft shelters in Europe and Asia. Only a relative handful are in Japan and mostly in northern Japan. None, I think zero, has been built in Japan uh, by either Japan or the United States since that time. Analysts have been calling for construction of these houses or shelters for decades, um, but in Japan's 2023 budget, uh, even though resilience makes the list, houses, those hardened aircraft shelters are not in there. Rather, there's a very small budget for what are called berms or revetments, little um, walls around aircraft with no overhead cover, much like the Egyptians used in the 1970s without much effect, and they would certainly not be effective today. So if Japan's acquisition of standoff missiles accords with political preferences and bureaucratic interests, resilience really doesn't. There's no military constituency, right? There are no officers in charge of concrete in the military, so there's no bureaucratic interest in shelters. All right, I'll try to speed up a little bit here. Um, turning to a third area, Japan is ramping up capability in new domains, cyberspace and electromagnetic areas, though it's doing so from an underdeveloped base. Uh, Japan established a cyber defense command in March of this year. It plans to increase its personnel within that by about 400% by 2030. 
a similar sort of expansion is underway in Japan's space forces. So a first operational space squadron was established in 2020. A second is being added together with an operational space group to coordinate the activities of the two. Uh, these commands uh, would pursue a number of functions, uh, intelligence, situational awareness, space situational awareness, and the defense of Japanese satellites against jamming and, and presumably dazzling. Uh, no capable military can really do without space and cyber, and expansion is pretty much an easy bureaucratic call. The new domains are a potential growth area for the military, and because no one's losing anything, they, don't, they didn't exist, it's relatively easy for the services to cooperate on this. All right, a fourth area includes the other conventional forces of the air, maritime, and ground uh, self-defense forces. These are areas with existing force structure. So we already have naval squadrons and divisions, air squadrons and wings, army divisions and brigades. So generally modernization involves the replacement of old platforms by new ones. Over the last few years with larger military budgets, um, the military has been able to increase the pace of that replacement. There is also some innovation in how that's being done and what's being purchased. Um, so the trend, I'll just throw out one example, the trend for decades has been towards lower, larger warships. And Japan is, in its new budgets, continuing to buy these large high-end destroyers, 10,000 ton destroyers. But for the first time in decades, it's actually developed some smaller ships too. So given the shifting balance of power, small shifts will help enable Japan to maintain a reasonably sized force of warships at an affordable price, even as it deploys some of these large end ships. So it's buying a 5,000 ton frigate, the Mogami class, which I believe is actually better than the current uh, US frigate, the Constellation class. And the 2023 budget includes a new class of even smaller coastal patrol craft weighing in at just 2,000 tons or about a fifth the size of one of these large destroyers. I could give you examples on the air side and the ground side as well. Um, uh, notably, um, you know, there, so there's change here in each of the services. And I would say each, each, you know, change in these cases can be accomplished without compromising the basic interests of the services. But that's not true of this last category that I'll talk about, um, which is really the biggest question mark and involves organizational changes that would challenge the relationship between services. Uh, these are changes that are long overdue and that have been discussed for decades. The first has to do with the services budget shares, which have not changed really since the Cold War, not in any dramatic way. Uh, but they haven't changed since the Cold War when Japan's military mission was to fight a ground war against the Soviet, against a Soviet invasion. So the GSDF, the ground forces, have by, by far the largest share of the budget, despite the fact that any conceivable conflict today would be primarily air and maritime. So after decades of discussion, we see some possible movement. So if we look at the, 21, uh, the 2021 and the 2022 budget, we see that overall the GSDF share has in fact shrunk. So, you know, cheers. I think we got fairly excited by that. But when we took a closer look, it turns out that if you look at just the base budget for 2022, before the, uh, the Jose Yosan, before the supplemental budget, in fact, there isn't change. It's the supplemental budget, which goes primarily to acquisition and the acquisition of warships and aircraft that has tilted things. So bottom line is it's a little bit unclear what's happening on that front. As Dick mentioned, uh, you know, there's been some discussion in the media also of implementing a Japan's first standing joint command. That would be also huge progress. But again, uh, that uh, would require the services to interact in new ways. It's supposed to happen in 2024. We are somewhat skeptical that that will happen. Even if it does, that would just be really a first step towards jointness. Um, but we would be very happy to be surprised um, and happy to see you know, real progress towards much deeper jointness on the part of the Japanese military. 
So uh, just in conclusion, uh, Japan is spending more. It's buying new things. Aspects of Japanese uh, defense programs are adaptive and reflect evolving ch challenges. But there's greatest movement in those areas that reflect political preferences and military biases. Um, uh, so again, lots of energy to you know offensive uh, missiles, missions, uh, and far less emphasis on making Japanese forces survivable. The services are doing a relatively good job of adaptation within their own areas, but asking them to cooperate in other ways or to shift the balance between them is a much harder uh, task. So I'm sorry for going on so long, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much for all of three of you uh, for a sort of shocking <laughs> uh, remarks for us um, that uh, I think uh, uh, Professor um, Samuel's right that it's a, a fear of abandoning by United States sort of uh, um, you know pushed us to to make these changes. But from your perspective, it seems like a little uh, late, but not least. So uh, there are many questions uh, we have from audience. First, I'd like to um, uh, take up the Dr. Michishita's question here. Um, he asked, if you are asked to get the priorities right for Japan, what kind of items on the list would you emphasize more and what kind of item would you de-emphasize? In other words, based on what the Japanese government is saying right now, what are the areas in which it is not investing enough and what are the areas in which it is over-investing? Well, my microphone is open, but I'm going to kick the can over to Eric because I think this is really uh, uh, better <laughs> answered by him. In fact, I think he anticipated Ichishita Sensei's question. Um, but Eric, why don't you why don't you take the first cut at that? Sure, and I think I would generally say it's the same. It's largely the same set of priorities that uh, you know we would recommend for the U.S. military. And you know, given the lethality of modern weapons, it's not really sufficient to add on a little bit of survivability or a little bit of resilience. Really, the services have to fundamentally. Uh, uh, you know, rebuild themselves around resilience. Everything has to revolve around resilience and survivability. Um, so that includes the organization of forces, you know, how large squadrons are, whether they're organized into um, wings or something else. Uh, I think access to civilian airports is absolutely essential. You know, you, you could easily double, triple the total ramp space, the total parking area for aircraft by doing that, it would be very cheap. Um, so many of the priorities, I think, are things that do not require huge amounts of money. Um, reorganizing the force would require money. You'd want to spend more on the support elements for those forces, right? So if you're reorganizing things into smaller packages and you want them to be more mobile, that does make them less sort of efficient from a peacetime perspective. You need a lot more support. Um, you need a lot more sort of maintenance capability. You need the ability to move things around quickly. So I would say, you know, all of that needs to be done. Hardening on a massive scale, I would say is, you know, absolutely essential. Um, the other trends within the services, I think are sound, right? Um, so moves towards smaller ships, I would say, you know, unmanned or very lightly manned uh, naval vessels, especially ones that fill single functions to include decoys, um, you know, that can sort of be a missile sink, uh, possibly others for ISR. On the air side, you know, more F-15Bs and UAVs, things that can operate from very small airfields or even from, you know, non-airfields. So I think that would be my general list. Um, Sam has done quite a bit of work on sort of operational military issues as well. So he might have some, some other thoughts. I think that covers a lot of it. I'll, I'll agree. I'll sort of hammer the cost point, right? What we're talking about prioritizing here is often what is most low cost and cost effective, which in the budget tight environment that Japan finds itself, even with the raise coming in, uh, I think is a, a benefit. 
Uh, and on the unmanned point, you know, there's been consistent recruitment problems in the Japanese military, and that's likely to get worse with sort of population trends and the aging population. And so uh, I think pursuing unmanned options is also imminently sensible and will be required um, in the future. Uh, so I second those points. And let me just let me just add that that as as an aging as the aging guy on this on this panel um, that that there are habits um, that military services get into uh, and fall into I should say and and become accustomed to uh, and it's easy for Americans to say Japan should do this Japan should do that this is not rational but something else is we're Americans talking uh, you know. We've done nothing with our aircraft carriers that now have big targets on them. Um, you know, we we uh, we have a navy uh, that is extremely vulnerable, um, uh, and, and almost as vulnerable, maybe as vulnerable as those aircraft um, that that Eric described um, on 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 runways um, uh, without without hardening uh, and and without uh, you know without concealment and, and mobility and so forth. So. Um, it's very easy for us uh, to say what should be done. It's very hard for us to get it done, uh, even in our own system, uh, with all the money that, with a record defense budget. So, um, you know, we wish everyone luck. Okay, great. So <clears throat> let's move to the next question: uh, Taiwan China issue. Uh, we think that Taiwan become next uh, uh, Ukraine, and so. If you have any idea, please assess likely Chinese tactics toward enveloping Taiwan. And then also um, another question is, how should it creatively prevent the China's uh, planned use of force, including combined uh, cyberspace and uh, influence public opinions to seize Taiwan? And uh, another one is, how would Chinese action toward uh, Taiwan affect Northeast Asian uh, political security relations, which is China, Japan, and Korean Peninsula. Any of you uh, are the panelists. Eric, do you want to talk about the TTX? Sure. So, um, all right, where to start? Um, <laughs> you know, I'll answer the last question first. How how would China's actions affect North Northeast Asian security? I would say, you know, it's it's having a profound effect, right? So Sam, uh, Sam already described, you know, the increase in discussion on the Japan side. I think, you know, from our perspective anyway, Japan seems very concerned about the possibility that uh, China might use force to reunify the island and what the consequences would be if that happens. All right, uh, I'll say just a few words about China's options for the use of military force. I mean, first of all, they're, they're sort of gray zone uh, coercive activities that are going on now. We're all familiar with them. There's no great answer to those, unfortunately. Um, as far as sort of the lethal use of force, China effectively has four different types of options. One is an invasion to actually conquer the island. Another would be a blockade to cut off supplies and starve it out and force its capitulation. A third uh, would be some kind of limited use of military force, like the, the seizure of an offshore island. And the fourth would be some sort of coercive uh, firepower strikes designed to coerce Taiwan through, um, you know, the application of lethal firepower, but short of an invasion. So um, which of those are, you know, more likely, least likely? That's open to debate. I would say I think the probability of sort of coercive use of strikes is quite low um, in the sense that it would have, it would carry enormous political risks for China, especially, uh, you know, inviting changes to policy by the United States and Japan without any certainty or even probability of success. Um, seizing an offshore island would be quite easy, but it would carry the same risks with relatively little reward. The exception, I think, would be Penghu, which is right off Taiwan's coast. And if that were seized, that would be a problem. There's a written, there's a reason that Penghu itself was written into first the U.S.-Taiwan alliance and then the uh, Taiwan Relations Act. 
Um, blockade and invasion. I think that's those are the two possibilities. We've heard a lot of talk coming out of the Pentagon from you know former Indo-PACOM commander uh, Davidson, uh, former um, uh, about an invasion in the 2026 or 2027 timeframe. Dick mentioned the TTX that we've been running. Um, uh, 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 we've been running a, a, a war game uh, designed by myself. Uh, Matt Kansian and and uh, and Mark Kansian um, uh, at the Naval War College and CSIS, respectively. Sam has been uh, working on that as well. We've run 26 war games using all kinds of different assumptions. Uh, the good news is that under almost no circumstances uh, is China actually. I'm sorry, is Taiwan actually occupied? So. In order for Taiwan to be occupied, either the United States has to not show up. In other words, if the U.S. does not ride to the rescue, China probably could occupy Taiwan. Or if Taiwan doesn't fight, right? So if it simply surrenders, then obviously uh, China only has to cross the strait as opposed to crossing and then conducting a large campaign. Um, but assuming that those two conditions don't hold, this is an extraordinarily challenging uh, prospect for China. It has to send a very large fleet across with a very large invasion force. And then that fleet has to sit while a large camp, while a large uh, um, ground campaign unfolds. So the fleet has to sit for a period of weeks while the U.S. launches very large missile salvos against it. So in our war gaming, it's just not a good prospect. We have not wargamed the blockade scenario. I think China would face many of the same challenges, but I'd be a little hesitant to speak too definitively to that. But I think, uh, you know, our view is that, you know, the, unless Japan's, unless China's back were up against the wall, unless it felt like it had no politically viable alternative, that an invasion or the large scale use of force against Taiwan would just be too risky. Sam, you came to the same conclusion based on, on different kinds of research about the, how That's the right. military balance is moving in China's favor, but is not yet uh, favorable. I want to say something. Yeah, about that. absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think the war games that Eric has run definitely point to the fact that this would be an immensely costly scenario. And what I've done is I've run a number of simulations using publicly available information on fighter aircraft capabilities, looking at a more modest scenario in which there's an attempt to establish air superiority by China over the Sinkaku Islands as the first stage in that sort of campaign. And what you see is that broadly, and this is, I think, consistent with research by the Gilly brothers um, and others that have identified that there are still large advantages that uh, U.S. and Japanese aircraft have technologically um, over Chinese fighter jets. And so in with, in modern combat, the importance of air superiority is pretty widely accepted. Um, you can see what the limits of uh, the, the lack of air superiority has done for a lot of uh, Russian operations in Ukraine. Now it's disrupted them. And so I think the fact that China would have trouble establishing this over, you know, non-contested from the ground airspace um, points to a lot of the limits in the growth of their military capabilities. Now, it's, they're certainly getting much more powerful um, and their military has grown stronger, but that doesn't mean that they are able to do this at low cost in a way that is politically acceptable. Um, and I think that's important to remember. There's, I, I think deterrence still has, I think, a powerful effect as a consequence. And so um, I, I think that Sinkaku scenario and Taiwan scenario, both are relatively unlikely in the near future. I also think, you know, the origins of the 2027 claim both are, are apparently related to CIA intelligence that uh, there's a goal of having the capability to uh, initiate a Taiwan inv invasion by 2027, which we'll see whether or not that, you know, whether that intelligence is accurate or not, I can't speak to. But if it is accurate, having the capability is quite different from then making the de decision to do it. And having the capability and having the capability to do it at a politically acceptable cost is another very different matter. And so I think those things countenance against the idea that there's likely to be an invasion in the near future, as well as because the military balance uh, still reflects that it would be extremely costly to do so. Let me just pull the lens back uh, for one moment um, away from Taiwan and to, about China uh, more generally, because that question has come up too about how China's actions 
uh, effect of you know, Northeast Asian relations and security and stability in the region itself. And, and it's, in a way, it starts with the same answer that, that Eric gave, which is it already has. And, and anyone who's interested in a more muscular Japan should uh, write a thank you note uh, to Beijing um, for, for being provocative, um, for, for growing so fast and, and being seen as, as so, so threatening. Um, you know, th that said, um, relations with China are very difficult to unwind. I think Japan is, has discovered that, uh, particularly in the economic domain. Um, I, I noticed uh, recently the, the, the outgoing uh, chairman of the Keizai Dou Yukai um, it talked about um, the need to not quite accommodate to China, uh, but, but to think harder about um, uh, sustaining and improving relations with China in the middle of all of this. Um, he, that was, that's not popular opinion. What China has done um, um, by repositioning itself and, and by, in a way, overplaying its hand in, in the region has led to higher levels of public support for something that had low levels of public support in Japan uh, for a long time. That is for military spending, for resisting Beijing. Um, it's led to the new levels, the new kinds of strategic relationships that Sam uh, described. Um, you know, the, 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 the RAA, the reciprocal, um, uh, the RAA agreements, um, the, the defense technology sharing agreements, intelligence sharing agreements that didn't exist before. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of the, to, to borrow a phrase and maybe distort it, but, but the mother of all changes in a way, which is the, 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 uh, the steps taken toward rapprochement between Japan and the Republic of Korea um, after the election of, of President Yuna. That, that certainly mattered, but, but it's, it's really um, a shared sense of, of threat that, um, that has brought them together along with head knocking by uh, the US government. Um, but, but, but there already has been a shaking up of the region and one that's invited in fact, I noticed in, in the Q&A, there were questions about Europe. Uh, it's invited European participation, European, European visits, European um, tentative European um, uh, feelers, uh, and some not so tentative, including uh, the UK, Italian, Japanese cooperation on the F3. So, I mean, this is, this is all China related, AUKUS, it's all China related. And, and, um, and, and as I say, um, Somebody should send them a, a thank you note. Okay, thank you. I see Kurokawa-sensei has arrived. <laughs> yes, um, Dr. Kurokawa, are you on? Um, can you unmute? Okay, sure. And uh, your face, yes, great. No, I had to make some comment. Yes, would you like to make some comment? <laughs> That was great. I enjoyed it, but I think recently, I think I have been really thinking what was the Homo sapiens? We have learned something because I think Homo sapiens is the most sort of uh, knowledgeable and wise species in, in this planet. planet. But, uh, why are we repeating the same thing again and again? And I'm also emphasizing particularly Japanese bureaucracy and, and government. What would be the sort of purpose of higher education. Uh, that, <laughs> that has been one of the major questions asking to many higher office in, in this Japanese government, like Minister of Finance and a few others. And I really start thinking about why we remain the same over centuries, learning something. And I think everybody has to die anyway and start fresh. So we learn, we accumulate more technological thing, but have we become wiser? That has been my major question and what is the role of higher education? We discussed this thing, how to make this entire <laughs> planet us reasonably sustainable and healthy. We are fighting all the time. Why is that? despite many become a sort of graduate of a university. 
So that has been my major question in these days, more become more philosophical. So you cannot make any significant thing, but I think in fact, I was uh, summoned by the uh, House of Representatives for this follow up of the Fukushima report. And I, I opened up my first thing was, you know what's happening in Ukraine and how the nuclear plants in Japan, about 40 or 50 of them are protected by sort of rogue action against targeted to nuclear plants in Japan and elsewhere. That has been my question. And I think that is, has to be a more like, you, you, we, can, we can do anything, but I think that is a prospect very difficult in democratic uh, countries and that has been what's happening in Ukraine and Putin and uh, Xi Jinping or the thing. And I think that's a homo sapiens. I don't know. Have we become wiser? That has been my recent inquiry. <laughs> so, uh, Richard, great to see you. And uh, Good to I see you too. I, I, I think I, I want to treat that as a rhetorical question because I think we all know the answer is that we're no, we're no wiser. Um, maybe I have to, you have to say that out loud, and, and you say it. We have to say it with, with, with more than a tinge of sadness in our voices. But, but as evidence of this, yeah. um, you mentioned nuclear power plants, right? So, the big debate, as as we are looking at it in Japan right now, one of the big debates over national security is how to find the money uh, to go from one percent of GDP to two percent of GDP, and one of the solutions. Uh, is to take it away from uh, the reconstruction budget that was set aside, part of it, right. the reconstruction budget that was set aside for what you care the most about, which mm -hmm. is the rebuilding of Tohoku and, 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 uh, and other areas hit by natural disasters, which we're going to see more and more of. Second, second thing is um, that, that the decision was taken to extend the life of 40-year-old uh, reactors to 60. Um, yeah. As a way, I guess, to save money and then and redirect it to uh, to the new needs of, of the military, it, that that seems like you know it just doesn't seem like a good deal uh, for the Japanese citizens, uh, and right. it's something you know that I, I would have inserted uh, in in an answer to Michishita Sensei's question earlier. Um, yeah. Is is you know you pull the lens back, you look at 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 the way in which the financing is is being debated and structured. Uh, right. And the needs um, for safe, uh, safe energy, um, and and you wonder whether the wires are not getting crossed. Right. And another issue of this changing world is connectivity, and it's very difficult to hide anything in in across national or institutional barrier. So I think that transparency is a very important element of whatever that is, because the trust. Is uh, one of the very interesting, sort of important issue. Transparency. If you hide something and reveal, but sort of dispose, that is where you're losing your trust. I mean, that is the government and others. You really have to be aware of this transparency is the key, whatever you do. Okay, thank you very much for you all. Uh, um, I'm sorry it's uh, time has come to end and we have many questions uh, still unanswered, but uh, we we'll hope that we can catch up in later, maybe later sessions. And uh, yeah. um, final word, uh, we were very struck by the presentation of three of you just, you know, presented us that uh, I think we need to, uh, to voice much more uh, loud to have shelter created <laughs> in the land of Japan so that we citizens can be, you know, be in a safe uh, area. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of three uh, fantastic panelists and thank you very much for sharing your views and we very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much. Nice to see you both again. Thank you. Yeah. With that, We'd like to close this session and hope to see you in the next session. Thank you very much for all for joining us. Thank you. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.